Welcome to the Bible study. I want to remind everyone that on our website, JesusTVNow.com, JesusTVNow.com, that we have uh, many uh, free Bible studies. Also, in the same website, we do receive tithes and offerings. Shall we pray? Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this time. We ask that you would fill us with your spirit. We ask, Lord, that you would uh, help us to uh, discern false doctrine, true, true doctrine, Lord, and that would you would guide us um, in your ways, that you'd help us to walk with you, to learn your word, Lord, and we thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we are in 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. And uh, I love this book uh, because it really helps people with an understanding of eternal security, whether or not you can lose your salvation, how important it is to uh, walk with Jesus Christ, and many, many very important themes. And last time, at the end of uh, 2 Peter, uh, we saw that uh, Peter knew that he had a short time left, and that he was shortly going to be um, killed for his faith. And we need to really let that sink into our hearts. Many times we read those things really quickly, and we just kind of pass by them and don't think about that. And if we do that, then that's a problem, because then when bad things happen to people, and the truth is only God will permit those things that are best. Um, but if we don't really think about uh, the way the Bible really is written, that people really did suffer according to the will of God, then you'll get stumbled. You'll be like, where are you, God? Why did you let this happen? I don't understand. Or why did you let that go on? And, and we need to really read the Bible the way that it is, and not uh, like so many false teachers teach that... Uh, uh, God just wants uh, everybody to be healthy and wealthy, and uh, in my opinion, though, most of those pastors just uh, want to be rich themselves. They're like, send me all your money. Yeah, that's it, and I'll be a good example. And, yeah, and I'll buy my jet, my new car. Ooh, I better get a bigger house because then it's a better example. It's amazing how evil our hearts can be that we justify things. But no, the Bible says that those that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And the truth also is, is that you can have joy in the midst of your trials and your troubles, in the midst of problems, in the midst of persecution. Why? Because Christ lives in me. And that's a beautiful thing. Um, but last time we did see that, and to read that at the end of the book of uh, uh, Second Peter, that he knew that he was going to die soon for his faith. That's a heavy thing. But it's also a beautiful thing to trust Christ in the middle of your problems, to understand that God is good, even though I don't understand what is going on around me. And one of the examples that I love so much in Scripture is the woman whose daughter was sick. And she went up to Jesus, and she said, Oh, Lord, help me. And what did Jesus say? Jesus said, It's not good to give the food to the little puppies. And he was talking about that the gospel was supposed to go to the Jew first. And it's not because Jewish people are better. They're not. We're all sinners. But the order was to the Jew first and then the Gentile. But Jesus was testing her faith. And she said, yes, Master, but the little dogs, the little puppies, they eat uh, the food that falls from the Master's table. And what did Jesus say? Oh, woman, great is your faith. I don't know about you, but I want that. To trust Christ, even though I don't understand what is going on in my life. To trust Him, to know that He's good, to look at the cross, even when I'm hurting, even when I'm suffering. That I know that He's good, just like that woman still knew that He was good, even though it seemed like He didn't even care. It seemed like He didn't even want to answer, and that's not true. He did. He was drawing out her faith. And he said, O oh woman, great is your faith. And why was her faith so great? Because it seemed like he didn't care. It seemed like he didn't want to answer, but he did. And during those difficult times, we need to trust God, even though we don't understand what's going on in our lives. Maybe you're sick. Maybe you're hurting. Maybe things happen to you and you don't understand. Well, I look at the cross and I trust him, just like that woman, even though I don't understand. And we also learned last time that we do need to know the Old Testament prophets. We need to know the whole Bible. because, uh, And we'll be speaking about that some more today. Uh, because uh, Jesus did give many examples from the Old Testament. And we can't understand the whole counsel of God if we don't study the whole Bible. 
And uh, we also learned last time that false teachers are led away by their own lusts, and they deceive people. And, and they may seem very, very nice and very spiritual and may have a nice smile. Hi, give me your money, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's really what they're saying. Uh, don't fall for that. Uh, gosh, that just is terrible. Don't fall for that. Um, what does the Bible say? Only believe what the Bible says, especially in these last days. There are so many deceivers. What does the Bible say? We also learned last time that judgment is coming, and it is coming, I do believe, soon. We see the signs of the times. We don't know the day nor the hour. Uh, of the rapture, but the signs of the times. Israel's back in the land. Europe is forming a unified government that's not perfectly unified, just like it says in the Ten Toes in the book of Daniel. There are so many prophecies that are coming to pass, so it does seem that it's very soon. But in a way, that doesn't matter. You can get hit by a truck today. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the way it is. Many people think, oh, we're going to live for it. No, that's foolishness. Today is the day of salvation. Repent today. Follow Christ. He loves you. He's in control of our lives. But the truth is we can die at any time. And I'm sure you know people that you can't even believe that they suddenly died. It can happen to anyone. So do all that you can for Christ with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength, all of your mind. And if you're more faithful than a pastor, you can have more reward in heaven than a pastor if he's not faithful. And so God is no respecter of persons. He wants to use you just as much as anybody. And nobody is really important. Only Christ is important. We are all equal in Jesus Christ. And this time, we're going to be uh, starting the book of 1 John, obviously written by the Apostle John. It was written... Uh, between approximately the, the years 80 and 95 A.D. And Jesus rose from the dead about 33 A.D. So uh, John is getting up in there in years. He's getting to be a little bit older, kind of like me. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> and we uh, want to do all that we can for Christ our whole lives. I don't know about you, but I'm always saying I don't want to get to the end of my life and like, well, I'm an old guy now and I hardly did anything for Christ and uh, I'm dead. Uh, and then I'm mean, standing before the Lord and uh-oh, what did you do? And I don't want to be like that. You can repent today and God will use you. God is gracious. And John uh, was the youngest apostle. When he was following Jesus, he was just a teenager. And in this, uh, this first chapter, we're going to learn about false doctrine. We're going to learn about walking in the light. We're going to learn that it's a lie to walk in darkness, to say that walking in darkness is good or is really pleasurable. No, it's only temporary. It always leads to pain. Sin always leads to pain. And the other one, another wonderful theme in the book of John is that the Lord wants us to be full of joy. That is God's will. We need to believe that. He wants you to be full of his joy. He wants to give us power over sin. You have to believe that. Maybe you're struggling for years and you still, oh, I'll never get victory. Don't believe those lies. God is gracious. God loves you. He wants to help you if you're sincere. We'll be talking about how not to be deceived with false doctrine. We'll also be talking about uh, the fact that God gives us eternal life not temporary life. He gives us eternal life. We'll be learning about the Trinity, that Jesus came in the flesh, walking in the Spirit, and uh, to confess our sins to God, and that He's a loving God, and He wants to forgive us. So let's start in 1 John uh, chapter 1, verse 1. It says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. So it's talking about the witnesses of Jesus Christ, of his life, of his miracles, of his death, of his resurrection. The apostles were witnesses. And of course, there were many other witnesses. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. And so what we see here... Uh, First of all, is the Trinity. And the first thing in salvation, the first thing that we must get right, is who is God? The God of the Bible is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three persons, but only one God. Now, we can't understand that with our minds, but we have to believe it by faith. And you say, well, I don't understand that. How can that be? Well, join the club. 
<laughs> there are many things we will not be able to understand about God. How can God be three persons but only one God? But he is. And not only that, but each one of them have their own will. They're, of course, in sync with each other because they are God. But the Holy Spirit, for example, decides which gifts of the Spirit he will give out. It is very interesting, but we have to accept that by faith. And the cults, uh, many times they actually um, stumble upon this. For instance, the Jehovah Witnesses, they don't believe in the Trinity. They don't believe that Jesus is God. They believe that uh, Jesus is Michael the Archangel. And that's just not true. They don't believe in hell. And so what they do is they actually are worshiping their minds in a way because they, they cannot reconcile the fact that the Trinity is in the Bible. And they'll give excuses and say, well, historically it's not true. That is irrelevant. What does the Bible say? The Bible clearly teaches that there is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so um, we are seeing the Trinity in this first part of the book of John. And Jesus is the eternal word of life. He's the source of all life. And the apostles were witnesses of his life, that he is the eternal God. They saw him. They heard him. They touched him. He had a body, a physical body. And there were some false teachers in those times, and there still are some, but not many. They were called Gnostics, and they taught false doctrine, and they taught um, that, uh, that Jesus really didn't have a physical body. They taught that all matter was evil. And so they taught, for example, he had no footprints. But he did have a physical body. It says in 1 John 5, 6 that Jesus came in the flesh. And so what they would say is they'd say, okay, well then uh, the Christ Spirit came upon Jesus. Um, it wasn't really uh, Jesus being God. They, in effect, deny the deity of Jesus Christ. And so what they say is prior to uh, Jesus' death, the Christ Spirit came upon him. But when Jesus died on the cross, the Christ really didn't die on the cross. Jesus died on the cross, but Christ did not die on the cross. And so what they would teach is they would teach that all matter is evil, and that all people have a spirit and a body and emotions, and that the intellect is good, but that the body is evil. And so all matter is evil according to them. So they would take two views upon that. There were the ascetics, and they would say, okay, well, if all matter is evil, then we will have to deny ourselves. We won't have anything to do with pleasure. Uh, we have to wear clothes that aren't so nice. We uh, torture ourselves. We deny our bodies. Uh, they say we won't have uh, sex, nothing of pleasure, because they say that all matter is evil. And then at the other extreme were the gluttons, and they would what? They would say, well, it's not important because the body's evil, so I might as well do anything I want. And so what they would do is they would do every evil thing with their bodies that they could think of. And so those things are false teachings. But the Bible teaches that Jesus did come in the flesh, he did have a body, and he did bodily die on the cross, he did bodily rise from the dead. And that is the truth. And the Trinity is in the Bible. The word Trinity is not there, but neither is the word Bible. And clearly we have a Bible, and the Bible does teach the Trinity. One of the uh, interesting teachings in Scripture is in Genesis 1.26, when God is speaking. Notice what he says. In Genesis 1.26, then God said, let us... Now notice it says us, let us. I wouldn't say let us, I'd say I will, but no, he said let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Isn't that interesting? So he's talking amongst the Trinity, let us make. So it's obviously talking about creative power. He's not talking to angels, he's talking, God is talking amongst himself in the Trinity. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And so it's very interesting. And many people try to say that the Holy Spirit is just a force. That's what the uh, Jehovah Witnesses teach, and that's false. No, he is a person. He's the third person of the Trinity. And Scripture teaches uh, that each person of the Trinity can think. You can grieve them. You can grieve the Holy Spirit. You can't grieve a force. You can't grieve gravity. 
And the Holy Spirit, as I said before, decides which spiritual gifts that he will give to us, real Christians. And Jesus is God, and he is the source of eternal life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except through him. If there were any other way, then why did he die on the cross? He wouldn't die on the cross for nothing. And many people try to say there are many ways to God. No, there are not. It is only through Jesus Christ, through his blood, through his death and resurrection on the cross, and our faith that he, in him, that he died for us and that he rose from the dead. The Bible says clearly that there's no other name under heaven uh, where we can be saved. In Acts 4.12 it says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There is no other name. No other name. It's not through Buddha. It's not through Hinduism. It's not through Muhammad. It's only through Jesus Christ. 1 John 1, 3 through 4 says, That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. And it's a beautiful thing. What he's saying here is our fellowship is truly only with the Father and with Jesus Christ, with God. He is the only thing that can fill my empty heart and your empty heart. So many people try to fill their hearts with things in this world, with career, with money, with people, with friendships, uh, with even a marriage. Those things will not fill your heart. And many of those things can be wonderful in Christ. But only Jesus can fill your heart. The church cannot fill your heart. Other brothers and sisters in Christ cannot. Again, there can be beautiful relationships, but only Jesus can fill your empty heart. Um, and he wants to be your best friend. And what a beautiful thing that he wants to. And he is infinite. And so it's not like friendships in this world that sometimes they betray you or they say, I'm, oh, I'm too busy, or they uh, want to be with somebody else because they're more popular or whatever, or they're not faithful or even cruel, or they uh, do things to you they shouldn't. Or That's a tragic thing. People are sinners, but God cannot sin. And he is infinite, so uh, he won't say, well, I'm too busy, I'm uh, with your neighbor right now, can you hold on a minute? <laughs> no, he wants to be with you. My favorite part of the day is I get a cup of coffee and I read the Bible or listen to a Bible study and I pray and I spend time with him and, and that's my favorite time of the day. And when you do it that way and you start out with the Lord, you have a wonderful day. You still maybe have trials and tribulations, it's normal, but the Lord is with you. And that is the way you should do every day and finish every day that way. And Daniel did it three times a day, that's even better. Uh, he prayed toward Jerusalem three times a day. And it's not because it's legalism. So many people say, oh, it's legalism. And I'm always saying, well, fine, then don't eat. <laughs> yeah, you, you can send me uh, your, your, your cake and I'll take it, your pizza. Uh, yeah, and we'll see how uh, you do when you don't eat for a while. Well, so many Christians do that and they hardly pray or they hardly uh, read the Bible. And they wonder, why don't I have victory? I just can't figure it out. It's a mystery to me. Well, are you seeking to obey God? Are you spending, I'm always saying, at least a half an hour in the Bible a day, a half an hour in prayer a day? We need Jesus. We are weak. Everyone is weak. It's pride to think that you're not. Are you stronger than David? I don't think so. Are you stronger than Samson? Well, I am big, big muscles. <laughs> no, not anymore. <laughs> but we do need Jesus. That is the only way we have spiritual strength. And the truth is, to be strong in Christ is to know how weak we are and to know that I can't do anything without Jesus and that I need him, I need to be with him. And he, it's a wonderful thing that he wants to spend so much time with us. And the truth is, the Lord wants to have fellowship with you every day, all day. And what a beautiful thing that is. And that's the only true place and only true place I can have joy every day, even in the midst of my trials. And what is the difference between joy and happiness? Well, joy is dependent upon my relationship with Jesus, my faith in him, my faith in the Bible. And I can always have joy, even in the midst of my trials and tribulations. But happiness goes up and down and up and down, doesn't it? What's an example of happiness? Oh, wow, here's a big piece of cake. I'm so happy. Yay! 
yeah, I got a big piece of cake. I'm happy. And then I'm done. And, oh, I'm sad. No more. I'm sad. I'm very sad. And then I also look down at my stomach, and it's bigger. And then I'm even more sad. <laughs> well, that's uh, called happiness. It goes up and down and up and down. But joy, it stays the same because I'm focused on eternity. I'm focused on Jesus. It's based upon faith that God is in control of my life and that he loves me. And that is God's will. He wants you to have his joy every day. What a beautiful thing. And it says in John 15, 11, These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you. Isn't that interesting? He wants that for you. And that your joy may be full. And so money and career and family and job and power, none of those things fill your heart. And especially sin cannot. Sin is deceptive. It seems fun for the moment. It seems fun for the moment to drink, but it's sin. It seems fun for the moment maybe to uh, commit fornication and, and sex and even steal and, and evil things. It may seem fun for the moment, but they always lead to pain. Sin always leads to pain. But my relationship with Jesus, I have joy in him, and I put on uh, Christian music and not music from the world, and I'm filled full of the Spirit. Full, filled full of the love of God, not because I deserve him, but because he wants to bless me by his grace. What is grace? Giving me what I don't deserve. And he fills me, and he fills my empty heart. And that's what happened with the woman at the well. Jesus went to the well, and, and he said, uh, please give me something to drink. And, uh, and she said, well, you don't have anything. And, and Jesus said, the water that I give you You'll never thirst again. And she's like, let me have this water. And that is the kind of water, the Holy Spirit that God wants to fill you with so you never thirst again. And that's a beautiful thing. And so the flesh is deceptive. Sin is deceptive. It leads to pain. And even choosing difficult things is better than sin. Hebrews 11.25 says, and this is what Moses did, choosing rather to suffer affliction. Wow, choosing to suffer. Again, we need to read the Bible the way that it is, not the way that false teachers are teaching it, and not the way that sometimes I kind of ignore those things. So you won't be surprised, you won't stumble when difficult things happen in your life. He chose to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. And so it says that here, that sin can deceive. It can seem like it's pleasurable, but it always leads to pain. And Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Any true Christian, he will never leave you nor forsake you. Look what it says in Hebrews 13:5. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now I want you to notice it says never leave. So that means he won't ever go away. But not just that. It says forsake you. I love the fact that the Lord is so complete here. Not only will he never leave a true Christian, what? He'll never forsake you. He'll never say, oh, I'm giving up on you. He'll never say, oh, I'm not going to try to bless you anymore. Oh, I'm not going to try to uh, convince you of something anymore, or help you anymore, or guide you anymore. No, those are lies of the devil. Never leave, nor forsake you. And that gives me joy in my heart. And if Jesus is my best friend, and, and I, I put him first in my life, then when people hurt me or bad things happen, I trust in him. I know he loves me. I'm close to him. And he, he is faithful even when I'm suffering, and I have joy in the midst of my trials. And it's not because I deserve it. I don't. It's by grace. That's a gift, a gift of God. And so my true fellowship is only with God. He created us that way. You can fight it. You can get mad and say, no, I don't want to do that. Well, then you're just going to be empty, and you're going to be angry and full of bitterness and hatred and whatever evil thing. Surrender to the love of Christ. He loves you. It's like he's trying to give you a hug and so many people are pushing him away. That's just foolishness. He wants to love you. He wants to forgive you. And when we have trials and tribulations, we trust him, even though I'm suffering. And he's not a God that says, well, you suffer in, in me, no. No, he suffered more than we ever will. The father did uh, when he sent his son, watching his son suffer on the cross. How horrible that would be. Can you imagine with your own child? And uh, 
I, I couldn't imagine that with my own son. The father suffered more than we ever will. And the son suffered more than we ever will on the cross, suffering, mocking. And he was perfect, sinless. We aren't. <laughs> Many times we cause our own problems, don't we? <laughs> God, help, help. <laughs> and if we don't justify ourselves and say, God, is my fault, please forgive me, he'll say, oh, of course, I'll help you, I'll forgive you. And uh, that's God's heart. And so uh, Jesus said, I call you friends. And it's amazing that God wants to be our best friend. In 1 John 1, 5, it says, This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. This is a very, very important verse. I personally use this verse many times when I'm going through heavy trials and tribulations because the devil will tempt me. And he'll say, well, God is, uh, doesn't really love you, or God doesn't really want to do what's best for you, or he's ignoring you, and all kinds of lies come into my head, and, and they can come from other people or myself. And I think, wait a minute, no, God is light. He is perfect. There is no darkness at all in him. He cannot sin. Jesus himself said, which of you can accuse me of sin? Nobody could. I can't say that. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> Which of you can accuse me? Oh, everybody go, yeah, yeah, I got one. I got one. <laughs> of course. Oh, yeah, yeah. But Jesus can't. No, he cannot sin. God cannot sin. He cannot do anything wrong. And uh, this is a very important verse. And it gives you peace that God cannot sin. He cannot lie. He cannot forsake any true Christian. And if you're not a true Christian and you haven't really made Jesus your Lord, you can do that today. And I'll give an invitation at the end of this Bible study. It says in, in Titus 1-2, In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. And so again, eternal life, not temporary life. We'll be talking about eternal security more in the next Bible study. Um, but Jesus promised eternal life. And he promised that. And God cannot lie. He cannot. He is immutable. What does immutable mean? It means he cannot change. And God does not change. And the Bible says that he is love. He is light. It's not like us where I have to say, uh oh, I better be loving today. I better de deny my flesh and I better be loving today in the power of the Spirit. No, God's that way automatically. <laughs> and he cannot change. He is love. He is light. He is holy. He does not change in every situation. He doesn't get moody like some of us do sometimes. He isn't that way. He is always perfect. And so if I get mad at God, who's wrong? Me. <laughs> and you are if you get mad at God. God cannot sin. And if I don't understand what's going on in my life, I need to remember I don't know everything. He knows everything. He has reasons that I can't even think of for doing the things that he does. Have faith. God is love. Look at the cross. Trust Christ. You're suffering. You're hurting. But look at Jesus on the cross. And just trust him, though you don't understand sometimes. First John 1, 6-7 says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. And so, uh, it's teaching us here that if I'm walking in darkness, and uh, the worst case are people that live in sin, that practice sin, those people have never been born again. Those are people that live in sin, live in fornication, adultery, they uh, live, uh, they're drinking, they're cussing, and uh, that's their lifestyle. They've never been born again. They may go to church. There's a lot of people like that. They're religious. They go to church every week. They go home. It's like they think, well, I got my ticket to heaven, and now I'm just fine. It doesn't work that way. No, you have to surrender your life to Christ and repent of your sins, give your life to him, live for Christ, and believe by faith in his sacrifice on the cross that he rose from the dead after his crucifixion, that he paid the price for your sins by faith, not by works. We cannot earn salvation. It is a gift of God. And there are so many people that go to church and they're not saved and they think that they are. And they like treat it like a, a ticket. I've gone there, I got my ticket to heaven, I'm just fine. And they don't live for him. They don't live every day for him. They don't seek his will. They have no hunger for the word of God. 
Those people are false. They have no hunger for prayer, for seeking His will every day in, in their lives. They are deceived. Those people are not saved. They're not born again. But a real Christian can stumble, can, can fall into sin and say, Lord, please forgive me. But they can't live in sin because the Holy Spirit lives inside of them and says, don't do that, Ken. <laughs> Ooh, okay, and it drives you crazy and then you need to repent. Those people re uh, repent because the Holy Spirit lives inside of them. They are born again. And so talk is cheap. If people say, oh, yeah, I go to that church and I'm a Christian and... Talk is cheap. It doesn't mean anything. What is the fruit in your life? Are you truly living for him? Are you really born again? Are you fake or are you real? I was fake for many years. I went to church, but I was still drinking. I didn't repent yet. And uh, finally, one day, I decided I'm not going to do that anymore. I truly repented, and I invited Christ into my heart. I gave my life to him by faith, and I was born again instantly. And being born again, we'll talk about that next time, is not a whole life process. It's instantaneous. That's why Jesus used the word birth. And the women out there are like, Yoo-hoo, I'm so glad uh, giving birth isn't the whole life. Because <laughs> it's painful, isn't it, for, uh, for women to give birth. And uh, being born again is a moment in time, just like giving birth is a moment in time. It's not your whole life. And so you invite them into your heart, and you're born again instantly by faith. And uh, people that say, well, I'm a Christian, but they walk in darkness, the scripture says they lie. They're lying. They're deceiving themselves. That's a heavy thing. It's a lie if you say you're a Christian, but you don't keep his commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. It's a lie if you don't love the brethren. Jesus said, if you have no love, uh, you are not one of his. Jesus said, um, people will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. And so look for the fruit, not just the words. And so many people fall into the trap and they get friends, even Christians, and they have other friends and think, oh, well, God brought them into my path. It must be God. Well, not necessarily. The devil sends people to church too. Or that girl, that, that beautiful girl, she's so sweet. She's got to, oh, that's got to be her. She's beautiful and got a, a voice like an angel. And she's got to be so spiritual. Not necessarily. Don't just look on the outside. Is she really born again? Is she really walking with Christ? Does she have uh, godly fruit in her life and ministry? and in her life in holiness. Don't just look on the outside. That's the mistake that even uh, the prophet Samuel made when he uh, looked at all the big, giant, handsome guys, kind of like me. <laughs> no, and, and uh, what happened? God said, no, that's not him, that's not him. And it's, uh, it's David over there, the kind of uh, ruddy-looking guy that's, uh, uh, that's him, that's him. And God said, don't look on the outside, look on the heart. That's where God looks. So be careful who you make for your friends. Be careful who you use for business partners. Don't be unequally yoked. Your best friends need to be strong Christians or it's better to be alone, frankly. Um, you'll get hurt. Um, be very careful and wait on God and don't assume just because somebody came into my life, it's got to be the Lord. No, pray about it. Wait on the Lord and, and see if it is the Lord. And look for fruit. And, and Jesus warned. He said... There will be many that uh, have clothes uh, of sheep, but they are actually wolves. And so on the outside, oh, they look like sheep, but they're really wolves on the inside. So be careful. And Scripture says that many will say in the last days, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? And didn't we do many good works in your name? And Jesus said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. So be careful. Not all pastors are saved. Not all ministry leaders are saved. Not all uh, uh, people that say they're Christians are saved. Be careful. What is the true fruit in people's lives? And so if people are walking in darkness, and they say they're Christians, and they live in darkness, the Bible says in this passage that they are lying. Um, you cannot have fellowship with God and walk in darkness. Now, of course, Christians, we're not perfect. Uh, we sin and we say, oh, Lord, please forgive me, and, and that your fellowship is restored. It isn't that you uh, uh, lost your salvation. 
Um, that's false teaching. Many churches teach, well, every time you sin, you lost your salvation. Oh, man, what a nightmare. Don't live like that. That's false doctrine. Can you imagine? Oh, I lost it, I gained it. I lost it, I gained it. We'll be talking about that more next week. No, the whole time, if you're a real Christian, you're still a son or a daughter of God. It's just fellowship. Just like my son, if he sins, and I say, well, you need to say you're sorry. And then he says he's sorry, but the whole time he was still my son. And that gives me peace that I have eternal life, that God has given me eternal life. And you can only be born again once. Once you're born again, you are a child of God, and God gives us eternal life. And you will know people by their fruit. That's what Jesus said we're to look for. Not words, but look for true fruit. We are to judge fruit. We're not to judge people, but we are to judge their fruit. Is that real fruit? Is it fake fruit? Is it bad fruit? We are to do that. And I like the example of my daughter. You bet I'm going to check out to see whether or not the guy that wants to uh, uh, go out with her when she gets bigger, uh, I'll look at his life and see if he's really got true fruit uh, for Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. And so, am I practicing truth or not? Um, do bad words come out of my mouth all the time? I'm deceived if I think that I'm a Christian and I live like that. Everyone makes a mistake, everyone sins, even Christians, sometimes. But living in sin, that is a characteristic of a false uh, Christian. And another one of a false Christian is they justify everything. Well, you're worse than me, and I'm better than my neighbor, and, uh, you know, I'm better than that, that killer over there. What does that prove? That's like saying, uh, well, I'm a little less dirty than that rag. <laughs> <laughs> I've got two dirty rags. Well, I'm a little less dirty than you. That doesn't prove anything. We need to compare ourselves to Jesus Christ, who is perfect and without sin. Whoa. And then I say, woe is me. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner in the, in the midst of a, a sinning people, just like Isaiah said. And then God washes us clean as we're repentant. Glory to God. But then as I walk in the light, I have fellowship with Christ. You cannot have fellowship with Christ when you're living in sin. Or even if you're in a period of rebellion as a Christian, just say, Lord, forgive me. It's my fault. I'm sorry. And the Lord will say, of course, I'll help you. Of course, I'll forgive you. And so don't fool yourself. If you haven't been born again, you can be born again today. And if you are a Christian, just confess your sins. Don't justify it. Don't give excuses. We always have some fault, even if it's not our, all of our fault. And say, Lord, please forgive me. Wash me clean. And of course he will. He loves us. And scripture teaches that we should do that daily. When uh, the disciples asked the Lord, teach us to pray, um, he said, give us this day our daily bread. And he said, forgive us our trespasses. That's talking daily. And some false doctrine out there, which says that you can be perfect as a Christian, does not uh, agree with what Jesus said. Jesus said, forgive us for our sins daily. And so obviously, that is not a correct doctrine. Christians do sin, but they do not live in sin. And we say, Lord, please forgive me. We don't give excuses. And God says, of course, I'll forgive you. Of course, I'll help you. He loves us. He helps us as a loving father. 1 John 1, 8 says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Again, the same thing. Christians sin every day, but to live in sin, that is what uh, false Christians do. And Scripture does teach that we are born into sin. Every single child is born into sin after Adam and Eve sinned. And... Uh, an example of that is that you may have the most uh, beautiful kids, babies in the world. My kids were <laughs> better than yours. No. <laughs> and they're beautiful little sinners. That's the way it is. But how do you, what's one of the reasons you know? Because you have to teach them how to tell the truth. You have to teach them how to, uh, to share. And, and we all know how to say, mine, mine, right? <laughs> That's natural. Uh, unfortunately, we are born with a sin nature. But when we're born again, then our spirit lives again, and I have fellowship with Christ. But I still have that battle between my flesh and my spirit. My flesh always wants to do evil, but my spirit wants to do good if I'm truly born again. But people who are not born again, that are not true Christians yet, they still are dead in their trespasses and their sins. They do not have fellowship with God, even though they think that they do. They do not. And so... 
Uh, real Christians, it's a daily walk. I'm born again, and then I stumble once in a while. I say, Lord, help me. Please forgive me. But the whole time, I'm still a son or a daughter of Jesus Christ if I'm truly a Christian. Um, it says in 1 John 3, 9, Whoever has been born of God does not sin, does not practice sin is what it means. For his seed remains in him. The Holy Spirit is inside of me and says, Ken, don't do that. Don't do that. And I'm like, okay, okay. <laughs> but if you're not born again and the Spirit of God does not live in you, that's why they live in sin. They have no fellowship with God. And he cannot sin because he has been born of God. And that's a beautiful thing, that Christ lives in every true believer. 1 John 1, 9, talking about our walk again, as we walk with Christ after we're born again. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so I'm walking, and then I, I, I blow it, and I, or I get mad, and I do something I shouldn't do, and I say, oh, Lord, please forgive me, and I don't give excuses, and I say, help me to repent, and the Lord says, of course, of course I'll forgive you, I'll wash you clean, and don't make excuses. Don't say, well, you're worse than me, and just say, Lord, please forgive me, I at least have some fault, and, and help me to repent in any way that I need to, help me, Lord, and, and God washes us clean, and he loves us. And we also have to believe it. Um, it says here that he is faithful and just to forgive us. And so even if you did something really bad, you say, Lord, please forgive me. And you're sincere. You need to believe what the word says here so that you have peace in your heart. Believe what God has said. And so that is what the walk is. I, I walk, I stumble, and I sin. I say, Lord, please forgive me. Help me. And hopefully you're sinning less and less and less as you're walking more and more with Christ and you're growing up as a Christian. Uh, 1 John 1.10 says, If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. And again, this is speaking to believers. Believers sin as well. And obviously non-believers, they, they live in sin. That's the way they are. Um, but believers sin every day, and as Scripture says, when he was uh, teaching the disciples how to pray, and we say, Lord, please forgive me. It isn't that you've lost your salvation, you gain it back, you've lost it, gain it back. Uh, that's a torturous life. No, it's just like my own son. The whole time he's still my son. And that gives me peace, that my God just reaches out his hand and he lifts me up and he helps me to walk with him. And so today we learned about the Trinity, the God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But there is only one God. And that Jesus did come in the flesh. He was born in Bethlehem. He did have a physical body. He walked among us. And he died and he rose from the dead bodily. And that we need to walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh. And that our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. It is with God, with him first. And that we walk in the light, then we have fellowship with God. And then if we blow it, we say, Lord, and we sin, and we say, Lord, please forgive me, and we restore fellowship with him. It isn't that we lose our salvation every time we sin. No, we're still a, a child of God if we're truly born again. And we confess our sins to him, and it's a beautiful walk with Jesus Christ. Now, if you aren't a real Christian, that's different. If you've never really given your life to him, and you know that you don't live for him. You know uh, that you may be religious, perhaps. You may go to church. You may go every week. You may even serve in the church. But he really isn't your Lord. You really haven't given your life to him. Or you're trusting in your own goodness. No, we're all sinners. We need to be forgiven. None are good. No, not one. And I want to give an invitation. Anyone who would like to pray now, you can invite him into your heart. And God will come into your heart. He'll forgive you by faith, not by good works. We cannot earn salvation. And you can have eternal life. Shall we pray? Dear Father in heaven, I do believe that Jesus died for me on the cross, that he rose from the dead. Please forgive me for all of my sins, everything I've ever done. I give you my life. I make you my Lord, my boss. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of salvation that you paid for with your blood, Jesus, and that you rose from the dead. Help me to walk with you, Lord. Give me your power. Fill me with your spirit. And for us that are Christians already, help us, Lord, to walk with you, to serve you with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind, to walk in the light as you are in the light, to make you our best friend. And we do thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.